Vending machine companies seem like the perfect company to some people. They can come across as low maintenance, easy to operate, and good money makers. They seemed that way to me when I was a young entrepreneur. I even wound up buying one and operating it with a partner for over two years. I got to experience the ins and outs of running a vending company and understand how you make money in that business. Hey, I'm Kylie. Now I'm the CEO of a startup company, and I like to make financial models on the side as a way to keep my Excel skills sharp. I had someone ask me on a previous video if I could make a financial model of a vending machine company. So here it is. I'm going to show you start to finish how to build a vending company model, how much you can make with a vending company, and what the key assumptions should be in order to forecast profitability. So let's get started. Okay, getting started on the vending machine company, I like to do all my financial models the same way and that just start with the assumptions. So that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna say assumptions here and then we're gonna build out what that looks like. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're also gonna, gonna narrow this down to a vending company that kind of operates in two spaces. Space one being snacks and space two being drinks. So that's what we really need to focus on. Um, one thing that you learn really quickly in the vending machine business is your margins are essentially set. Um, so we're gonna go here and say snack margins and then drink margins. With the one caveat on drink margins, we're also gonna say, we're gonna break the drink margins down between bottles and cans. So we're gonna say bottles and cans, and then we're just gonna set these to the right. That way we can call this out a little bit easier. Um, okay, so the snack margins, 50%. I mean, you literally, if you buy some chips for uh, 50 cents, you sell them for a dollar, and you have 50% margins. Um, it makes pricing really easy. Um, in all reality, you have to, you know, adjust a little bit because like uh, a, a package of Lay's at Sam's is like 46 cents or something like that. Um, so the same thing with bottles. But the thing is, usually, and this is kind of a secret of, uh, of vending, if you go to a distributor of the products that you want to sell, say you want to sell Coca-Cola, the local distributor has vending machines. If you establish a relationship with them, you get to use those vending machines for free as long as you buy the product from that distributor. So the, you know, the Coke distributor um, in Texas, let's just, just throw that out there. Um, you, they generally have m vending machines on site. You buy product from them, you put it in your vending machines, you get to use the vending machines for, for free that they provide to you. They'll even come and maintain them. In our situation, if we had a problem, they would come and fix it. It's really a great, great setup. The only thing that you add to it is maybe a credit card reader or something along those lines. You have to fill it with change and uh, you're good to go. Really nice. An additional caveat is that most distributors like that won't sell cans in their vending machines. So, and the cans are the higher margin of the two. Um, also, water. Water is way higher margin. If you ever look at it, you know, if you buy Dasani from a Coke distributor, you might pay 50 cents a bottle, but it's going to be $1.50 a bottle. And so you're making way more margin in that situation versus a can of Coke, or I'm sorry, a bottle of Coke, which is, you know, 75 or 80 cents a bottle, and you still sell it for $1.50. So you're making more money that way. So your bottle margins are a little lower. Let's say your bottle margins are around 40%, but your can margins are around 60%. So depending on which way you look, um, do you want more revenue because the bottles generate more revenue at $1.50 each than the cans at $1 each? Do you want more margin? Also depends on your goal of the business. Are you trying to build the business up to a place where you can sell it because they generally sell on a multiple of revenue because the margins are set in that industry? Or do you, are you care about cash flowing at long term and living off the income? These are decisions you have to make, but I can kind of guide you on the, the principles here. So these are the margins you're going to work with. We're also going to look at sales tax. So sales tax is another kind of bear within the vending industry, uh, especially if you operate in a large metropolitan area that has different municipalities within it. Um, say you operate in uh, Dallas, 
and I know Dallas fairly well. Um, that's not where I operated my company, but it, I know it. And so you have, you know, city of Dallas, you have Irving, you have Plano, you have Frisco, you have McKinney, you have Rockwall, you have Fort Worth, you have Las Colinas, which you have all kinds of different municipalities that collect their own sales tax within, you know, that kind of general area. So you have to be registered with each of them in order and pay sales tax with each of them, depending on the location of the vending machine. That can be kind of time consuming and onerous. So it's easiest if you concentrate all your machines in a small area. That's also the most profitable because your distance between each machine on your service route is minimized. So, but we're gonna say sales tax averages at 9%. Obviously you don't necessarily pass this on to the customer because th there's not many vending machines that add tax on the end. You know, if, it, if a bag of chips is a dollar, it's a dollar. So anyway, that's, uh, that's one of our assumptions there around 9%. We're gonna look at credit card fees and there's a couple of those. So we're gonna say the transaction fee, that's gonna be about 3%. And then you have the reader monthly fee. And that's probably gonna be five to $10 per machine. We're gonna err on the high side and we're gonna say 10 monthly. Um, and we'll go from there. Um, maintenance is, is a different thing. Honestly, machines generally work pretty well. Um, also, one of the benefits of more or less leasing the machines from the local drink distributor, Coke or Pepsi, is the refrigerated units, the refrigerated vending machines are generally the ones that break the most. And if they're maintaining them, then you don't have the maintenance fee on them, the maintenance nightmare associated uh, with that. Um, also, you're gonna have some banking fees depending on how you do this because the bank's gonna charge you to bring in a boatload of cash. And that's generally what you're gonna be bringing in is a boatload of ones. Um, they're gonna charge you to count those. So you're gonna have a little higher service fee at your bank. It's probably gonna be closer to a hundred bucks. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and just assume that there. Um, so yeah, let's look at, at how this may scale across one machine and then we'll kind of apply that to a bunch of different machines and see how the growth kind of uh, goes from there. So let's just look at a, a snack machine first, and then we'll look over here at a drink machine. And add machine on the end here. Okay, so uh, what we're gonna do is we're gonna say that the average snack machine has five basically slots on each shelf, and there's five shelves in each machine. Maybe a little bit of a smaller machine, to be honest, um, but let's look uh, and see how that works out. So all in all, we have number of um, slots, and I'm gonna back up just a second and say there's 10 slots on each shelf. So we have, we have a shelf, and it has five different rows, and each row holds 10 items. Um, and so there's 50 items on each row and there's five rows. So the number of slots is 250. So it'll hold 250 items. Um, we'll look at our average price. It's probably gonna be around, especially these days, we're probably gonna be around $1.25, okay? So the, the max revenue from one full machine is the number of slots times the average price, $312. Um, so then what's your turnover? Days turnover, it's an important metric. Can you turn it over in five days? Can you turn it over in 30 days? It's really gonna be location dependent on that machine. High traffic areas, it's gonna clear quick. Also, those probably already have machines in them. Seemingly one of the best places to put machines are in hotels, they're very competitive. Also, most of the time the managers are gonna want some sort of, uh, royalty on it or a commission on it. And so we're gonna go ahead and go down here and we're gonna say commissions. All right, so commissions is around 10% and that's pretty standard, you know, and that's off of top line, not bottom line. You pay 10% commissions to the managers or whoever's allowing you to put the machine there. And then, you know, they either kick that back to their employees, they put it in their pocket, who knows? Don't ask the question, just pay them the commission. 
Um, so I would say average turnover is about 15 days on a regular machine that is, you know, in a decently high traffic area, maybe a mid traffic area. So if it's days turnover, then we'll say turnover per month. So we are gonna estimate there's 30 days in a month, which is pretty accurate. So we're gonna say 30 divided by 15 is two. So then we'll say monthly revenue. So we take the turnover per month and we multiply it by the max revenue. We can do $625 a month in revenue. And so what's our margin? And we'll even call this gross margin because it's not net margin. Gross margin, well we know it's 625 times the snack margin. So one snack machine, probably do around 300 and so dollars a month. I would say that's pretty accurate. Now, if you go into a high traffic area, then you know your day's turnover might be five. And look, you triple your gross margin right here. But I would say 15 is a safe bet. Some slower ones, it's gonna be closer to 30. The other cost associated with this is spoilage. A lot of snacks spoil relatively quickly, especially if you're selling pastries or something like that. They're higher ticket items. You mark them up more because you know you're gonna have a lot of them that go bad. Okay, let's go back to here, 15. Then we're gonna look at, we're gonna put spoilage in here as a metric. And we're gonna say that around 10% of our inventory spoils, just based on turnover. Um, some snacks are more popular and they get done quick, they get through quicker, they're empty quicker, others kind of stick around. And so our gross margin after spoilage is one minus this times that. But we have to put our parentheses the correct way. So we're looking at around $280 a month, or give or take. Um, then what we're gonna do is we're gonna call, uh, we're gonna go down and skip a line and we're gonna say route costs. So um, you have gas, you have uh, van maintenance, and you, you know, that's about all, okay, if you're servicing the route yourself. If you're paying somebody, it's a completely different ball game, but let's not get into that quite yet. So um, depending on, on a few factors, which we can factor in here, uh, we'll get in uh, gas and van maintenance. So let's move these down a little bit. Let's say um, distance between machines. This is just one machine, but we're gonna say that it's uh, seven miles, okay? And our gas mileage is um, 15 miles per gallon. So cost of fuel is 15 divided by seven times whatever gas price we have, which right now, as of July, 2022, gas is around $4.50 a gallon. Um, so let's move those down a little bit more. Oops. Um, price of one gallon of gas. I'm putting this in here because of, in ex speaking from experience, fuel was a relatively high cost, higher than I would have assumed it would have been. Okay, so the price of one gallon of gas, um, $4.50. So the cost of fuel is 2.14. So the gas mileage divided by the distance between machines. And, and looking at that, I divided that backwards. So what we're gonna say is, the dis distance between machines divided by gas mileage times cost of fuel. So it costs us $2.10 to go to one snack machine uh, in gas. So, and then the van maintenance, we'll just put at a flat rate of per machine of around you know, the same as the cost of fuel. Because you have to do oil changes, you have to do whatever it is. You could be truck, van, whatever. We always use a big van. Um, and also that's gonna factor into you know, going and actually getting the snacks, getting everything else. I mean, a day is actually spent, you know, you spend 25 to 30% of the day getting your inventory and then the rest of the day actually servicing the machines. Once you get to the machines, 
they they don't take that long. The travel co- travel time in between machines uh, is is a lot of the day, and that's once again why you want them grouped together. So optimizing for distance between machines is a huge, huge, huge thing, and making sure your route stays profitable. Okay, so let's go over here and do the same thing for the drink machine. All right, so a number of slots on the drink machine. Um, off the top of my head, I can't remember how many they could hold, but it's a lot. I'm trying to think. I think you can get 24 times. You could probably hold around 200 bottles in a drink machine as well, maybe even more. I'm actually going to say probably 250 slots in a drink machine as well. Uh, the average price on a drink machine is $1.50 to $1.75, at least a bottle machine. Um, we're going to go with $1.50 here because you might have some can machines mixed in as well. Um, so the max revenue is going to transfer over. It's slightly higher. The day's turnover is actually probably going to be a little bit higher because for some reason drinks are starting to... They, they seem like they're slowing down. Of course, it depends on where you're putting it. Um, but you know what? I'll do it at 15. You can make this model for yourself. Change it. It all works over. So the turnover per month goes the same way. Monthly revenue, gross margin, spoilage, gross margin after spoilage calculate the same way. But what we need to do here is we need to make sure that this is on the bottle margin and the spoilage is actually gonna probably be higher depending on your turnover. Um, for some reason, bottles only last about three months. Cans last, I think, 12 months. It's another reason you, cans are nice. Um, but we're gonna say 15% here. So a drink machine, snack machine, you got them here. The nice thing about this is that Generally, you have a drink machine and a snack machine right next to each other. So the costs are split between the two machines. Um, so what we can look here is we can say total for two machines. And we're gonna do it right here in the center. So gross margin after spoilage, you have $536 a month. And then you have cost of fuel, which goes right here. You have maintenance. For some reason I have trouble spelling maintenance regularly, even though I actually type it more than I think I thought I would. Um, and then you have the externals associated with running the business. You have um, insurance and a few other fixed costs that we can get into once we actually build out the model here in just a second. Um, so, you know, I would say it's a relatively good estimate to say that Two machines over the course of a month, probably they could make you somewhere in the $500 range. Um, but once again, we are leaving out commissions. So commissions is around, are around 10% there. And then we have the card reader fees. And this is times two because we have two machines. So we have $10 a month here times two, and then we have transaction fees. And what we're gonna do there is we're gonna say that it's about half of the transactions uh, that occur between the machines are credit card transactions. The other half are probably cash. So we have 536 divided by two, and that's actually incorrect. Let me go back up here. So what it's gonna be is on the revenue, not on gross margin, so it's the revenues combined, which is 687. And then what we'll do is we will multiply that times, or divide that by two, and then we'll multiply that times 3% over here. Uh, got it all screwy there. There we go, times 3%. So that's around $10, not too big of a deal there. So we're gonna say um, net before G and A. I'm gonna take the total for two machines, subtract this, 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 and this. 448. And then you have any other expenses associated with it. So two machines, $500 a month, plus or minus, before you start to net anything else out, probably accurate.
Okay, so we know how much a machine will make. We know how much a, pay, a machine pair will make. And I would say you want to do machine pairs. Drink machines on their own, snack machines on their own. First of all, you don't want to be competing with somebody that has a, a drink machine next to your snack machine. You want to put both of them there if it's possible. So um, let's look at, at this really quickly. Number of machines. We'll say, you know, we can build that out over time and we're gonna say revenue. And then we're gonna say expenses, we know what they are. And then we're gonna get into hours and do insurance. And then we're going to throw any other G&A expenses that we need to throw in there. And then we're gonna to get to a net. And I'm actually gonna say hourly pay that you wind up making as a result of doing this yourself, maybe with a partner. Um, so I wanna go ahead and throw hours per machine over here. So I would say on good days, whenever we were running routes, we could do probably 10 to, uh, mm, let's say 15 machines. 16 machines, eight accounts. Um, so 16 machines over the course of eight hours, you probably have half an hour per machine um, in time to, to get that done. Although it was probably a little more like 10 hours. Um, but we'll say 30 minutes per machine, including travel time. It's a good target right there. All right, so we, we do the number of machines in multiples of two since we have pairs. Um, and Actually, let's just make that a little simpler and say number of machine pairs. So we have number of machine pairs. Let's work off of that. All right, so we have one here and one, two, three. Let's just follow Fibonacci for a second. Five, eight, 13, 21, 34. All right, that's optimistic, but we'll go from there. And it'll do, so month. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And let's say you stop at 40, 45, 50. That's close enough. Nine, 10, 11, 12. It's a lot of machine pairs. 100 machines is a lot of machines, especially for a single person operation. There are definitely people that operate more than that, um, but this will give you an idea of how much you can realistically make with these vending machines. So the revenue would be the number of machine pairs times the combined revenue here. So we'll say the sum of those is right there. So the revenue is going to be just the sum of these two monthly revenue numbers. Oops. And we'll just put that there and multiply it by the number of machine pairs. The expenses are going to be just the gross margin after spoilage subtracted out of the monthly revenue. So basically if we say that the revenue is this number and then we subtract out the gross margin after spoilage. So the expenses are eight, eight, $838.75. Uh, let's actually move this down so we can get a better picture of what gross margin looks like at scale. Um, so gross margin would be the revenue minus the expenses and those expenses just being inventory expenses, clearly. All right, and so the number of hours. So the number of hours would be the number of machine pairs times two, which is how many pairs there are, times the hours per machine. So one hour right there, you know, you're working it's a couple hours a week because you have to do inventory and a few other things like that. But you know, one machine pair, you could do all right with. Insurance is probably going to be around uh, $250 a month, plus or minus. Um, G&A, I would put at around 20%, uh, just you know, office, accounting. You may not have any of those other things um, associated with it, but you need to have some G&A expenses built into that. So it's around 20%. And so we'll do 0 0.2 times revenue, oops, plus two times revenue. Um, and then we're not quite to our net yet because we still have to get out the 
the cost of fuel, the maintenance, the commissions, the other few things uh, going on there. So what we need to do is we need to go back to the ex expenses and not s subtract the gross margin after spoilage. We need to subtract the net before GNA, which is down here. So that takes our gross margin down and a few other things. So as you can see here, with one machine paying insurance and having some GNA expenses, you're negative because of the fixed costs. Also, if your hourly pay, say you want to make, I don't know, 30 bucks an hour, you pay yourself something decent living wage, at least, then you're going to say 30 times this hour and uh, net after paying yourself would be your net minus your hourly pay. So you're in the negative for one machine. So let's hit, see how this scales across several machines. First of all, let's look and see what we need to lock in in order to pull it over. Expenses, be that one. Gross margins, good. Hours, need to go here. B. Insurance, good. L9, good. Good. Lock in the B cell here. And net after paying yourself is good. All right, so let's see how this scales with a few different machines. And uh, then we'll wrap the video up. And hopefully you have a good idea. Okay, after a small break where I had to figure out the dumb mistake I was making in order to get the expenses line and gross margin correct as I scaled, real big brain part there, I decided, I figured out what I needed to do. So on the expenses row, you have to take the revenue, subtract out the net before GNA, but you want to multiply the net before GNA times the number of machine pairs. You don't want to multiply the whole thing times the number of machine pairs because then you'd be doubling it doesn't make any sense. All right, so here we are, and you can see the formula right there on the way I'm doing it. Look at the highlighted cells, and you can see how I did that. Um, so now, let's drag it over and see where we hit profitability and how much money we can make if we had 50 machine pairs. So let's look here and say that, see our expenses scale with the number of machine pairs. So as we get to two, our expenses are around 1,800 a month, three, all the way up to 50, which is 100 different machines. You're spending a lot of money on inventory at that point. You're talking $40,000, $50,000 a month. You're bringing in $68,000, $70,000 a month. So your gross margin is great. It's really good. Um, but as you bring that down, of course, G&A gets to be a huge number, $13,750, and your net... 8400 At this point, you'd have to be paying, your, paying somebody to help you, I'm sure. Um, also, this is fairly optimistic uh, as far as that's concerned. Um, and the reason I say that is because having 50 machines that turn over all of their inventory twice a month, you're, you're, you're doing really well. So combined, you would say that you are looking at your net, plus most of your G&A, you know, you're making $20,000 a month. I would say it's probably not gonna happen. So the way that we look, go back and change that is to say, okay, how long does it take in order to turn over inventory? Just by saying, let's say 30. So you turn over the entire inventory machine once a month. Well, your net goes way down. You, you know, your G&A is still here at 68.75, your net's at 32.15, so combined, where saying you're going to recoup most of your GNA because that's salary to yourself or something like that, you're still making ten thousand dollars a month with fifty really solid performing machine pairs. That's a realistic number. Now, how much is this going to cost you in order to buy a route that that, that nets something like this? Well, we're going to say that it's thirty-four thousand dollars a month times twelve, and make that times two probably gonna cost you $800,000. So $800,000 and you're gonna make $120,000 a year. So 10,000 a month times 12. 
And so, you know, you're looking at an annual ROI, 15, 20%, that's standard. Um, so this is a little insight into the kind of how the numbers of vending work. They're really not much more complicated than this. Um, you could add a little expenses here, a little expenses there, but at the end of the day, this is how it's going to look. You're going to get 50% margins, more or less. You're going to go to Sam's. You're going to buy a bunch of snacks. You're going to go to a drink distributor. You're going to get a bunch of drinks. You'll have to set up an account with them. You'll have to pay them, everything else. Um, they're going to provide you the the drink machines, hopefully. You're going to provide the snack machines, and you're going to get accounts that are high traffic accounts. You'll probably pay a 10% commission. And you can make a great living. I mean, who wouldn't be happy making $10,000 a month? That's probably going to be a pretty much full-time job. But that's a great gig. I mean, really, it's a great gig. And I think it's possible to make it work. Um, it's not low effort, though. And it's not passive whatsoever. It is very, very active management. But you can make great money and you can have a great business. Um, you have to deal with customers. I think it's a great thing to learn from an early age make great money and scale from there. And then when you want to sell it and move on to something else, there's always the next person ready to buy it. So hope this was insightful. I hope you learned something and uh, stay tuned for the next video. If you have any ideas uh, for something you'd like to see me break down, happy to do it. Leave a comment and uh, I'll try to get to it soon enough. Thanks for watching.